There are a lot of dudes on YouTube and TikTok giving us their college football takes, and some of them are pretty insightful, but nothing compares to hearing from the guys who actually played or coached at the highest level. One, because they've lived an experience that most of us haven't, so they can relay the feelings that teams are actually going through. And two, because they've got relationships with the coaches that no one else can build since they've all come from that same tight-knit community. But that's the closest we get to hearing how coaches actually feel, because even though Joel Klatt, Matt Leinart, or Kirk Herbstreit can feed us little bits here and there, most of the big time coaches keep their cards close to the chest. But then I saw this article pop up on Athlons and I couldn't wait to read it. So today I'm looking at what anonymous Big Ten coaches have to say about their conference opponents and I'll give you my thoughts on every team on this list. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden and this is Corn Crazed. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss any of my preseason videos. And if you want more video reactions like this, hit the like button and help us get to 1000. But now, let's get into it. He's hit and He's set. taking a shot, downfield, wide open end zone, caught touchdown. May's usually a pretty slow month in terms of college football news since you're coming off spring ball and then you're about two months out from summer camp starting. And the one thing that college football fans have gotten to talk about and look forward to all month is this EA Sports college football game that comes out in about a month and a half here. And yes, I will be playing it, I will be streaming it the night it comes out at midnight, trust me, July 16th, I will be just as excited as you are. But outside of that, there just hasn't been that much news. Today, I did see that we got some more uh, time releases for Nebraska's schedule. So you can now see the first, what is this, six games. They've got the times ready to go. UTEP's going to be a 2.30 kick. Then you've got three home night games in a row. Obviously, Colorado, I'll be at. I'm very excited for that one. Then you go to Purdue. It'll be an 11 a.m. kick. Rutgers will be either 2.30, 11, or 3, it looks like. We don't know about any of the games on the back end except for Iowa. That's going to be a night game on Black Friday in Iowa City. Usually, that game kicks off at, I think, 10.30 or noon around then. So this one being a night game is going to be special. Obviously, don't like it at night in Iowa, but it is what it is. And hopefully Nebraska is prepared for the challenge that will come that day. But the article I really liked this month out of all the articles I saw online was this one from Athlon Sports. You know, I used to read Athlon. I used to be a subscriber to their magazine and I would get that every single year when it would come out, their, game, their preseason preview. And uh, this one in particular talks about Big Ten coaches talking anonymously about their conference foes for 2024. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, huh, I want to hear what coaches have to say because usually, like I said in the intro to this video, they keep things close to the chest and they don't want their opponents knowing or they don't want their opponents to get all psyched out or hyped up off the words they have to say because they typically try to use those words as inspiration to go and beat up on the teams who made the comments. But because this is an anonymous article, I'm hoping we'll get a little bit of insight as to how coaches feel, whether it's good or bad about every school in the Big Ten. So that's what I'm gonna react to today. I haven't looked at this article yet. I haven't read it at all. I waited to do it with you because I'd rather give you guys my live reaction to something that I'm so passionate about. So the article starts by saying it's not easy getting college football coaches to honestly comment on another coach, player or team. Most coaches don't want to give opposing teams bulletin board material said that, which is why there is a lot of coach speak or overused cliches used during the year. And yeah, I'm hoping this will pull back the overly used cliches. In order to get an accurate assessment of teams heading into 2024, Athlon asked coaches in the Big Ten to anonymously talk about their opponents. I love it. These scouting reports come directly from coaching staffs and do not necessarily reflect the views of Athlon's editorial staff, which, yeah, I would hope this is specifically coming straight from the coach's mouth. So this could be coordinators, position coaches, head coaches. It doesn't talk about which coaches that we're going to hear from, but they're all anonymous. So I can give my takes on teams, other talking heads, like I said in the intro again, they'll all tell you what they think, but there's nothing as valuable as what you're hearing from coaches who are actually going up against these teams because they're talking to other players, they're talking to other parents, they see what's going on because they're watching film at a totally different level than we all are, right? So hopefully we get some insight to all these teams in the Big Ten and it looks like it goes in alphabetical order because it starts with I. 
and it does. So it starts with Illinois. Brett Bielema might not be on the hot seat, but this is definitely a prove it season for him. It feels like they lost their good momentum with their staff and their roster about two seasons back. Brett built the program back up by finding and developing a lot of local and regional guys instead of swinging and missing in places like Texas and Florida. They've lost some key in-state battles recently that hurt them. The Donovan Leary kid could push Luke Altmaier. That could be a really interesting quarterback battle to watch. This isn't a bad roster at all, but if they have another losing season, the momentum will be gone. And what they're referring to on, he's not on the hot seat, but it's a prove it year. Back in 2022, they went eight and five. They had Chase Brown. They had Chase Brown's brother. I think his name was Sydney. They had Devin Witherspoon, who was like their star DB who went in the first round. Illinois was hot. They lost to Michigan that year, I think by two, and that was in the big house. So it looked like they had a lot of momentum and they were building forward. Brett Bielema obviously had a big or strong history in the Big Ten, went to the SEC, wasn't successful, but it looked like he found his place back at Illinois. They lost some guys to the NFL. They lost Ryan Walters to Purdue. They talk about recruiting here. Well, they only landed two out of the top 10 guys in their state in the last class. So they lost a lot of them to the SEC and other Big Ten schools. You talk about the Devin Leary kid. Devin Leary, or sorry, Donovan Leary is Devin Leary's brother. Devin Leary was at North Carolina State. Then he went to Kentucky. I think he was a sixth round pick in this last draft. And going up against Luke Altmaier, who had a 13 to 10 touchdown to interception ratio, it could be his job to win if Luke doesn't perform early on. I'm not too high on Illinois, and I don't think that they're going to be a team that challenges going forward because I think a lot of these Big Ten West teams who had the privilege of playing in the West against really weak coaches and really weak competition over the last 10 years here really got a good opportunity. But now that they're going into the Big Ten, that's going to have a much tougher, or the new Big Ten, that's going to have a much tougher and more well-rounded schedule. It's going to be hard for these teams like Illinois, who can't recruit at the level that these other schools will, to compete for championships. And I just have relatively low expectations for them going forward, even though I think Brett Bielema is a good coach and could get them to be a perennial six-win bowl team. Moving on, we've got Indiana. Indiana, one of my best friends went there, and he's a huge IU fan. We talk about their program all the time, but he's an IU fan the way I'm a Nebraska fan, and he has no idea what's going on within the program, uh, at least not to the same level that we as Nebraska fans know about what's going on with ours. And to me, that tells me the fan base just doesn't get the same info or access to their team uh, as we do or other the other big programs do. So I'm excited to hear what they have to say, this coach has to say about Indiana from a coaching perspective, since a lot of fans don't really know what's going on behind the closed doors. So it says there's a lot of talk about the program for the first time since any of us can remember. Sigs is a really good hire. It shows that the school wants to be competitive and respectable in football. They're taking football seriously in NIL too. They brought in a few studs from James Madison and they've worked the portal well. The competition level in this league is still above them, but they should look more talented, especially on offense. The Matt quarterback, Curtis Rourke, is pretty solid. If you're setting reasonable year one expectations, I'd look for them to build an offensive identity to help in recruiting. So they hired this guy, Kurt Signetti, who has an incredible history as a college football coach, but not so much as a power five coach or a D1 coach. He was successful at JMU last year. They went 11 and two, I think. And Indiana landed 31 total transfers. I think half came from James Madison. They talk about Curtis Rourke in this article. You know, he was at Ohio and he had 7,500 passing yards. I think he was a three-year starter there. Looked really good for a Matt guy, but how will that transition in the Big Ten? They've got to play some really tough teams. They've got Michigan State, Washington, Michigan, Ohio State on the schedule. And that would make them a borderline bowl team at best if they had a season that was really special, similar to what happened at JMU last year. I don't know that they recruited well enough in the portal to be able to compete in the Big Ten right out the gate, especially with a grueling schedule and coming off of two, three, and four win seasons over the past three years under Tom Allen. But I do think Indiana is on the right track. They went and got someone who's hot and flashy. Signetti says all the right things. If you saw some of his uh, off-season interviews, he talked about the portal and trying to figure out NIL. And it was just a spicier conversation than any other Big Ten coach would be willing to have. But he has to have some flair too. And because without that flair, he's not going to attract the right players. Since I don't think a lot of people want to go to Indiana specifically. Now, 
from a recruiting standpoint, they did get Julian Lewis, who is one of the top quarterbacks in this next class, who is expected to go to USC or Georgia. They got him on campus for a visit coming up here pretty soon. So maybe if they can land five, or not land five stars, but maybe if they can attract five stars in recruiting, that means that they've got a bright future ahead and landing some four stars or some guys in the state. Moving on to Iowa. Everything here is automatic except the offense. They're a premier development and depth program at how they scout, build, and develop on defense and special teams. It's just the offensive component. How much is new OC Tim Lester really going to affect this program? How much can Cade McNamara do coming off an injury? Are they going to come out in 11 personnel on first down, which means three receivers? Tim Lester was a three receiver, four receiver look guy at Western Michigan. This is one of the best tight end programs in the history of the game. That's undisputed. I don't think anyone really knows what it's going to look like, but the idea that head coach Kirk Ferentz's son was the sole problem on offense? No way. So what this coach is insinuating is that he's not a big believer in Tim Lester coming in from Western Michigan, where honestly, he didn't have that much success. This isn't a really decorated offensive coordinator. This is a guy who Ferentz went out and hired that he could put under his thumb, who he could manage and who could basically be an assistant to what Ferentz wants to run. They talk about how could they come out in 11 personnel on first down and try and throw it. Well, you look at their receivers coming back. Their top two guys combined for like 360 yards last season. So I'd be shocked if they changed this off offense up especially knowing that they returned their top two running backs who combined for like 1,300 yards rushing last year. On defense, this is kind of the point. Defense and special teams is the side that they've built and developed, and that's the side where they lean on to really make them a dominant team every year. And I use the word dominant loosely because they've been dominating inferior competition, and every time Iowa goes to play a serious opponent like Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, or anybody who's really talented in the SEC, they struggle more. Uh, it says, and keep in mind, they've played SEC teams in the past like Kentucky and Tennessee, but those teams weren't even great. And I still think they lost one of those two games or maybe even both of them. Anyway, they get Sebastian Castro, who I think is a first rounder. Uh, he comes back in the defensive backfield, even though they lost... Uh, I can't remember the other guy's name, Cooper DeGene. So they're going to have a great defense again. Special teams will look good. But yeah, the big question is how good will their offense be? And I'm just not a believer that Kirk Ferentz is going to go out and change up the offense. They're going to try and stick to their roots. They're going to try and lean on defense and special teams. And just like this coach says, they're one of the best tight end programs in the history of the game. So that's going to be their strength, their tight end and their running game. So we'll see how Iowa does. I just don't have a big belief that they're going to develop into a strong Big Ten team going forward. I think they're another team who beat up on the Big Ten West and were extremely successful because of it. But now if they're playing Oregon, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State year in and year out, they're going to end up with some seven win seasons, even though they do have such a dominant defense. Maryland, the biggest need is finding a replacement for Talia Tagovailoa. And it doesn't look like they had one guy really step up and do that in the spring. They have a lot of talented individual pieces on both sides of the ball because Mike Loxley is an elite recruiter. But the knock on the program is that they're missing something to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. I wouldn't bet against that staff and their experience when it comes to personnel. I don't think Maryland's going to be the top in the NIL, uh, top in the nation in NIL. Uh, but that entire staff knows how to recruit, even if they're losing a third of the roster every year. Maryland is in the perfect area. They're in the DMV, which is kind of the East Coast, DC, uh, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, that whole area. So Maryland is able to go and get some of the best players in the country because of their location. I don't know anything about their NIL. I do know Mike Loxley's done really well on offense. They went to Nebraska last year until Leah Tugaviola lit it up with his star receivers. They have a really good running back in Roman Hemby. I think it's really impressive that they were able to win eight games last year in the East, and they had an ACC win over, I think, Virginia Tech and an SEC win over Auburn in their bowl game. So they have shown that they're building up and they're improving. Now, I think when he talks about Talia Tagovailoa needing to be replaced, I don't think that's realistic at a place like Maryland. He was second team all Big Ten. When's the next time we can expect to see Maryland with 
a guy who's even third team or honorable mention Big Ten. I just don't see that being an option for them going forward. They got MJ Morris out of the transfer portal. They have another guy named Billy Edwards. One of those guys is going to win the job, and they're just going to have to rely heavily on their three big weapons, who are their top two receivers from last year, and Roman Hemby, who comes back at running back. But Maryland's an interesting program. Not sure how they'll fare going forward because the competition is going to get tough. And I just don't know if they're going to have a quarterback who's like Tug of Viola ever again. But if they can pull somebody in to manage their offense, they do have skill talent around him. Moving on to Michigan, the national champion with a new coach. The trick for Sharon Moore is to keep the momentum of a national championship culture through all the roster turnover. I think you'll see a lot of familiar Jim Harbaugh practices and ideas this first season because they've got to rebuild before they can put a new signature on the program. The defense will lead the way for them. That can help bridge the rebuild on offense. Will DC uh, Wink Martindale just rip it and blitz? That's going to be interesting to see. They're basically turning over the entire offense and they need to find some receiver talent for whoever wins that starting job at QB. This is going to be a massive transition, even though they kept on the interim from last year. They're going to take a step back, but maybe not as far as you think. What's interesting about Michigan is I had in my head that this would be an eight win team this year after they lost so much on offense. But their defense is elite and they're getting even more talent. Jaden Mangum, who was a star safety at Michigan State, potentially going to a place like Ohio State or Nebraska, ended up going to Michigan. He just transferred in. They've obviously got, is his name Will Johnson, the corner who's a first rounder, Mason Graham, defensive tackle, who is a potential top five pick. The defense isn't going to take a step back at all. And if they're fully reliant on that side and they're just going to run the ball with somebody like Donovan Edwards or throw it over the middle to uh, Loveland, I can't remember his first name, who's their star tight end, who's another NFL guy. Maybe they can make the offense work. I think having multiple first rounders on defense is going to really help them out. And I don't know what their schedule looks like. I haven't looked at it, but I do think Michigan is probably closer to a nine win, maybe even a 10 win team. And I haven't looked uh, recently, but I'm guessing their win total set at nine and a half for this season. So maybe a tiny step back because they probably won't make it to the national championship, but this is still a team who's going to compete for a big 10 championship at the very least. Michigan State says, and this is a really interesting team because they went out and got what I would argue is the perfect coach fit for their program. Jonathan Smith is a great coach and his offense can be really effective in the Big Ten, but it's going to be a bumpy transition after the few years that roster has lived through. This is a staff that does more with less, which is why they were so good at the last place. But I think there's a resistance from some people at Michigan State to go back to that Mark D'Antonio mentality. I think they're bracing for a lot of turnover through the portal windows. They've brought over the Oregon State QB, Aiden Childs, who's probably going to be their starter. The run game was really bad last year. They need to put everything they can into getting some balance on that offense to be successful in year one. This is a huge transition year. The culture change from Tucker to Smith is massive. So I looked at their roster, really their depth chart, and it looks like half of their two deep is coming from the transfer portal. They've been crumbling since 2021 after they had a huge portal year, and I think they won 11 games. They beat Michigan. Uh, I can't remember who they played in the bowl game that year. Pitt. They played Pitt and they won that game. So that was a really big year for Mel Tucker. But after that, it was all downhill. The transfer portal experiment for him only worked one time. and He wasn't able to sustain that energy after there. So this is a team or a program really that's looking for stability since Mel Tucker's plan of action didn't really work. Now you've got Jonathan Smith who came from Oregon State. He was excellent there. He had two really good seasons back to back and he put out multiple all Pac-12 caliber players and they were beating top 25 teams consistently even though they didn't have the best roster on the field at the time. They talk about Aiden Childs in this article. You know, He was a four-star quarterback, I think a top 10 quarterback in the country coming out of California in his class and he's gonna be a big guy to watch because because he's going to have to lead this offense that's you would assume going to be run heavy since that's what they did at Oregon State and that's what's been successful at Michigan State in the past but because he's more dynamic do they have the athletes on the outside who can, he can get the ball to I think that this coach is built or this entire staff is built for the Big Ten and I don't think it's a matter of if they're going to get back to winning and being a 9-10 win program kind of like D'Antonio had him back in the day uh, I think it's a matter of when and is it a two-year rebuild a three 
I'm not too sure, but I do think that they're getting the favorable end of the stick with this new conference realignment, getting to play different teams and not being forced to play Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State every season. I'm really looking forward to watch them, even though I don't like them uh, as a team since they're a little bit of a crossover rival or were a crossover rival for Nebraska <clears throat> when they had the East and the West divisions. Next up is Minnesota. They're never dull, that's for sure. I think head coach P.J. Fleck chased UCLA and some other jobs pretty hard to get out of there, and it didn't happen for him. The transfer quarterback from the FCS, Max Brosmer, could be a really exciting player in that offensive system. He's already a captain for him, so they really believe he can be a game changer for their offense. The new defensive coordinator, Corey Heatherman, is known for a big attacking scheme from when he was an FCS coordinator at James Madison. It'll be interesting to see how that translates to this league. Minnesota doesn't have the kind of personnel that can allow you to blitz like that. It's interesting because Minnesota traditionally has had a pretty good defense. They ranked in the top 15, I think, two out of the three, uh, two out of the last three years, and they've put multiple guys into the NFL. But their offense is what the the really lacking area has been. Because when I watched Minnesota succeed, at least back when PJ Fleck first got there, they had a bunch of really talented guys. You had Mo Ibrahim, you had Tyler Johnson who made it to the NFL, Chris Ottman Bell. Uh, who were their other receivers? They had a couple other receivers who were pretty stuck. Dudley. And they had a quarterback who could get it done uh, done as well. I can't even remember the quarterback's name off the top of my head right now. He was the big white guy who was pretty balanced as a runner and passer, at least early on. And they had some big upset wins over Penn State and teams like that. PJ, you know, won nine games. I think three, was it two out of three years he won nine and one year he won 11? Something like that. And I think that hype that he was able to, uh, to gain from those big seasons at a place like Minnesota made him a really hot to uh, coaching candidate. And it was his opportunity to leave at that point. But now, if he's not getting these jobs, like he didn't get the UCLA job, even though he wanted it. And it says he chased some other jobs, which obviously this coach speaking to it knows more than we do about what coaches or what jobs he went after. Him not getting those jobs says something about PJ to me. It, it says that either these other schools didn't think he was the right fit. They didn't like the way he runs his program. I know there are a lot of people who question his hype game and the way he likes to talk a lot and build up all the references. But if he couldn't get out of Minnesota when they were hot, What's going to happen when they turn into a six, seven win team every year? His stock is going to drop. And I just don't think that he is going to have the same opportunity to get a high level job unless he can build Minnesota back up to being a consistent nine win team like he had them in that 2018, 19, I think 2021 was the last time they won nine games. So anyway, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes for PJ, but I think this was his opportunity to leave Minnesota. And I'm not sure how excited he's going to be to try and go and revive his career now that he's had a few um, down seasons. I think he's coming off a seven and a six win season. And that obviously isn't the standard that he built up, um, at least in the beginning of his career there. Moving on to Nebraska, an exciting one because Nebraska fans obviously have really high expectations and hopes for Matt Rule and his new quarterback. But let's see what this coach has to say. They're going to break through this year. It's just a question of how big they should definitely be bowling. It's all about the quarterback. They've tried to slow play it as much as possible, but he's clearly their best option. The most talented, the guy who makes the system work. Rule's done a great job reworking the offensive talent. They're going to have some breakout receivers, and they have a really deep group of running backs. Tony White is going to be a head coach soon, but getting him back for another year is huge for them. I thought the shift to the 3-3 worked out really well for them, and they're starting to look like an old, legendary Nebraska with the size and talent up front on defense. So start from the top. They're going to break through this year. It's just a question of how big. They should definitely be bowling. I would bet a lot of money that they're going to be a bowl team, right? But are they a seven-win team? Are they an eight-win team? Could they win eight in the regular season and potentially get to nine in a bowl? The question is, how good is Raiola going to be and how big of a step will the offense take? Because I believe the defense will be just as good or better than they were last year, especially with a more efficient offense who doesn't turn the ball over and put the defense in bad situations. This article talks about having breakout receivers. He's obviously referring to Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nair, who are both proven commodities. 
You look at some other receivers on Nebraska's depth chart, and a lot of those guys got injured last season and never had a chance to make an impact. You were playing true freshmen who now have had opportunity to develop, and they could be impact players. I think Jalen Lloyd is probably going to be their number one receiver for years going forward. So this article is an exact representation of how I would talk about Nebraska. And I think this coach has a pretty good grasp on what's going on over there in Lincoln. He's obviously seeing what's going on in recruiting. And based on this article, it gives me hope uh, or at least some excitement that what we as Nebraska fans believe about this team isn't just what we believe. It's what other people who are respected in their industry uh, believe as well. Moving on to Northwestern. David Braun might go down as one of the best interim head coaches in the history of the game. What he was able to do to keep that locker room committed and the culture going after Fitzgerald was really remarkable. Really curious how the Zach Lusion hire at offensive coordinator works out for them. San Diego State ran a lot of motion and shift, and they did a good job tailoring to the roster. And that's something that Northwestern has really struggled with over the last few seasons. This is a team in desperate need of a consistent offensive identity that they can recruit to. Now, I have zero idea what to expect because last year, David Braun came in at a really awkward time after Pat Fitzgerald got let go. Fitz had that program running for a long time and he had it running the right way because they were taking underperformers from high school and they were turning them into Big Ten players. I say underperformers at the Big Ten level. They were still good enough to play in other conferences, but he was able to recruit guys that no one else in the Big Ten wanted and turn them into Big Ten winners. To, I mean, they got to the Big Ten championship game back in like 2019. So Fitz had it rolling. David Braun comes in, no head coaching experience, and I think he caught people by surprise. Northwestern was supposed to be really bad because Fitz had him only at, I think, three wins the year before. And David Braun went out and won a bowl game in his first year. They beat um, they beat Utah, who was a really strong team, out of the Pac-12 last season in their bowl game. So Northwestern was such a surprise uh, that I'm not sure they're going to be able to keep their program under wraps the way they were last year. I think that's a team that now has a target on their back and teams know that that's a good program that you got to watch out for because they could honestly upset anybody in the conference. I don't think they could beat Ohio State or Oregon, but any anybody outside of the two most dominant teams in the conference, they could upset. You know, they're always developing players and they're finding ways to win in the West or they were finding ways to win in the West. It's going to be interesting to see if they can now compete with better coaches and better competition across the board since they're going to have to play those teams from the East and now those teams from the Pac-12. I don't have high expectations for Northwestern going forward, but it's always a program who can, uh, can surprise you and pull off some upsets. So we'll see if David Braun can keep the momentum coming from what he had last year. Ohio State, it's not national title or bust, but it certainly beat Michigan or bust. And the expectation is always to win the league. This is maybe the most talented roster Ryan Day has had since he took over. Will Howard doesn't have to be special. He just has to be smart. That signing didn't turn heads the way some of the other flash or portal, uh, portal quarterbacks might have, but all he has to do is manage and distribute. They're absolutely stacked at other positions. Day is a great collaborator. The Chip Kelly thing won't be a nuisance or a problem at all. If you believe what Chip Kelly said, that he wants to just focus on ball and not worry with the admin stuff, this is a fantastic hire. Nothing really matters until they can get Michigan off their backs in November. The standards are higher than anywhere else this offseason. It starts by saying it's not national title or bust, but it certainly beat Michigan or bust. And I, I know for a fact it's beat Michigan or bust, but I do think that this is a team that needs to make the national championship. Two years ago, they lost to Georgia in the playoff game, and that was a team who would have yeah, they would have won the national championship over TCU that year if they would have made their field goal. So I think it is national title or bust. You got to make that national title game, especially when you've got the most expensive roster in college football. It also points out, or this coach also points out that Will Howard doesn't have to be the best player on the field. He has to be a game manager and a distributor. You've got two of the best running backs. I mean, you've really got two of the top three running backs in college football on that roster and their receiver room is flooded with five-star talent. So if Will Howard or Julian Sayan, who might come in and take over as a starter halfway through the year, if one of those two guys can just manage the game effectively, 
this Ohio State team is going to be a problem. I don't know what to expect, uh, but I would think if I was an Ohio State fan, I would expect national championship. Oregon, they're a playoff contender and can battle anyone in the new league. Watch out for these guys this season because OC Will Stein and Dylan Gabriel make a lot of sense together. When you look at how Stein developed guys at UTSA, Gabriel already having a lot of game experience, they could really light a fire. When, uh, where the program has really evolved is the front seven on defense. They're as talented and well-coached as any of the big two schools, Ohio State and Michigan, at these positions, and they can get after it. That's Lanning's fingerprints on the program. Of the four schools coming into the league from the Pac-12, this is the most complete and dangerous. You know, the reason that I'm so concerned about Oregon, not concerned like in a bad way, but concerned that Oregon's going to come in and run the league or run the conference right out the gate is because Dan Lanning acts like and seems like one of the top three coaches or top five coaches in the entire country. He obviously worked under Kirby Smart most recently at Georgia. Then he goes to Oregon and builds them into a dominant defense. When this article talks about him having his fingerprints on the program and says that he evolved the front seven on defense, it's because the front seven on defense looks just like any school in the SEC or the Big Ten. They look like they can compete at the highest level. And then you bring in top level talent on offense like Dylan Gabriel and their new OC from UTSA who had a lot of success there. And we're talking about the complete package. So this, this is pretty much my exact um, idea about Oregon. They're going to be a contender right out the gate. They can compete with the big two, which is Michigan and Penn State, or Michigan and, and uh, Ohio State. And I would look for them to potentially beat Ohio State in this first year since they get them at home. And I think already that opening line is set at uh, Oregon as the favorite. So it's going to be an exciting year to see how Oregon does in the Big Ten. Penn State, this is a team who... I really want to be successful, and I was a big fan of when they had Trace McSorley and Saquon Barkley, but they just haven't been able to turn the corner. It says they've been the definition of the best of the good programs for a while now. They're never great. They would have made the 12-team playoff last year, but they were so noticeably behind Ohio State and Michigan that it really didn't matter. The expectation is to compete with those schools, and they've almost always trailed them under James Franklin. The season is on Drew Waller and how he develops with another OC, Ander Kotelnicki. Andy Kotelnicki. They haven't scared elite programs with their offensive skill position guys since Saquon and Trace McSorley days. You can talk about a million other things, but that's the real difference between them and the conference leaders. OSU and Michigan scare you with their talent. They have to hit that next level as an offense. What's so interesting is the problem they're in is that they're an average program and they're just good enough to beat everybody in the conference, but they're not good enough to beat the top two teams. And now with USC and Oregon, Washington, who could be a threat two, three years down the line, you've got better coaches. Is James Franklin going to be able to turn this team from an average team that wins eight, nine games every year to, or I guess nine, 10 to getting to a playoff and actually winning a playoff game? I'm not too sure. Right now with Drew Aller, I'm going to say no. Drew Aller looks like a five-star bust. He's not a bust of a quarterback. He's still good. I'm sure he'll make it to the NFL, and he's going to be a guy who's a project for somebody. But in terms of what he's done so far, Drew Aller just hasn't hasn't looked like the guy who can get it done. They got cooked in their bowl game against Ole Miss, and with this new OC, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to turn Drew Aller into a star, and I think it's probably Drew Aller's last year before he goes pro. So... A lot's going to uh, lots gonna be put under the shoulders of this Andy Kotelnicki guy from Kansas, and he was special at Kansas. Go look at the Kansas offense and what they were able to accomplish over the last two years. And if he can bring a fire to the Penn State quarterback room, maybe they'll be able to compete at a, a higher level. But up to this point, they've been average at best. And my expectations, as long as Drew Aller, uh, Drew Aller is there, is that they're not going to do too much more than they have so far. Keep in mind, 10 wins is great. Nine wins is awesome. So even if they get to that point, it should still be a successful season. But when you've been there as long as you have James Franklin and you make as much money as you do and you have the resources that you do at Penn State, you would hope they could turn a corner. Moving on to Purdue. 
Watch these guys for a defensive breakout. They didn't fully understand the system that Ryan Walters installed in year one. They've brought in some really talented transfers and a lot of their key guys are back. This is going to be the identity of their team. The freshman safety from last year, Dylan T uh, Thieneman, was an All-American. He's their kind of guy. That's their model. Hudson Card is a solid and experienced quarterback, and he's got another year under his belt in Graham Harrell's system. They need to develop the O-line and the receivers better, but accept, expect them to improve overall this season. You know, I'm not bought in on Graham Harrell's system, and I don't think Hudson Card lived up to expectations last year since he only threw for like 2,300 yards. I do think their defense will be better and they're going to have a defensive breakout soon because Ryan Walters is a defensive minded coach who's going to figure it out. But they lost their two best players. Each uh, each side of the ball had one. It was Burks at receiver and it was Scourton at linebacker. One went to Oklahoma, one went to Texas A&M. And I just don't think that they have the talent to be able to take a huge step forward. I think they won four or five games last year. Maybe they improve this year and make it to a bowl game. I don't know what that schedule looks like, but I do have low expectations for Purdue because they're Purdue. They don't have the resources other schools do. They've got a first time head coach. And although I do think they could build back to have a strong defense, it's the portal era. And if they get too many good players, those guys are going to hit the portal and go to other schools, in my opinion. Next up is Rutgers. They turned the corner last season, and for the first time since Greg Schiano came back, they're going to have the depth you need to be competitive in the league. They finished in a spot where they were obviously less talented than the teams they lost to, and they were as good or better than the rosters they beat. The next phase is elevating and recruiting and pulling that bigger conference win. They have a really nice stable of running backs, and some decent guys have developed at receiver. I would say they're on track to move up a little bit and maybe catch somebody off or somebody by surprise but they're still building and still significantly behind the eight ball uh or behind the elite of the league don't know what i was reading you know they got rid of gavin wimsat in the transfer portal they picked up eighth and kaliak manis and that's going to be the real question are they going to turn the ball over less with kaliak manis and will it make the offense more efficient the defense has ranked inside the top 15 the last two years and that was playing in the big 10 east now their schedule this year is extremely easy their toughest games are on the road at nebraska on the road at usc on the road at Virginia Tech and home against Washington. So this could be the year Rutgers wins nine games if they can pull one or two upsets out of that group I just listed. But I have high expectations since they return so many guys on defense and Greg Schiano knows what he's building. So Rutgers is a team to watch for, I'd say. UCLA. They're going to be really interesting to watch in the next few seasons. I think that Chip Kelly lost his taste for the head coach position and what it takes these days from the executive side of it to the new rules and the portal. Deshaun Foster wants to be there and he wants to lean into the energy of the city for sure. Eric Bieniemy came back to college or Eric Bieniemy is back in college and it'll be interesting to watch. It's too early to tell what the roster is going to do this season, but they're trying to fire up the brand and get the alumni and boosters into NIL and get the energy up. It's been a really quiet and forgettable program for a long time in recruiting. You know, even though it's been a quiet and forgettable program in recruiting, they've still drawn in some really good talent and they've had multiple guys go to the NFL. What I've noticed is the Deshaun Foster energy was kind of like the Scott Frost energy at Nebraska. People were really excited excited to get him back in. He was the first choice by boosters and by players, and they wanted to get somebody back in there who understood the program and who had been a winner at that program. And Foster was a star running back there, I think back in like 2005. I don't know. I grew up watching him and I think I was like 12 years old when I would go to UCLA games and see him. But Eric Bieniemy is kind of the biggest question mark. He's a superstar NFL coordinator from Kansas City. Didn't do that well for the Commanders last year. I always want to call them the Redskins. But he didn't do too well in Washington last year. So what are the expectations for him in his first year at UCLA? And how much different will the offense look? You know, they return their number one quarterback. They return their number one receiver. I think they're in the worst position to succeed in this conference change because they have a new OC, a new DC. The culture is different. But, uh, and they lost two of their best players to the NFL and the USC. But... Can they go out and win six, game in the, six games in the first year with the amount of talent and the coaching pedigree they have? 
Probably. I just don't know where I set the expectations since they did lose so much and they're in an awkward place coming to the Big Ten from the Pac-12. Now, a team who isn't in an awkward place, I actually think they're positioned to be a really good team this year, is USC. It says Lincoln Riley screwed up and held on to a bad situation with his DC a season too long. But hiring DeAnton Lynn from across town was a smart move. Kind of a can't beat him, hire him situation. Expect improvement schematically overall with the new system. And they've upgraded in the secondary. They're going to be better than they were under Alex Grinch. Obviously, they're replacing Caleb Williams. But the bigger question is if they can get both lines to play better. They can ease the new QB in if they're protecting him and if they're getting a push on the defensive side. They didn't look anything like the old USC glory teams in the trenches these last few years. What's so interesting about USC is Lincoln Riley was so damn stubborn that he kept on a DC who literally tanked their program for these last two years. He had a generational quarterback who obviously didn't have the offensive line he needed to succeed, but he had every everybody else on offense and he just didn't have a defense who could match that output. So I think the timing is perfect now that their competition level is going up, that they were able to go out and get a new defensive coordinator. The last two years, I don't think or an accurate depiction of what this SC team is going to be going forward since they were building from scratch. And obviously this was a rebuild program. So Lincoln Riley now in year three understands what the challenges have been. And even though he's going into the Big Ten where there's going to be tougher competition, I think some of the teams they play are pretty on par with what they were seeing in the Pac-12 last year since the Pac-12 was a really defensive, uh, defensive strong conference last season with teams like Arizona, Oregon State, Oregon, and USC had to play them all. So I think with the, with the new guys they've added on defense from the portal, they've added like five transfer guys, and with their new DC, they're going to be poised to do pretty well in the, in the Big Ten this first season. I just don't know if pretty well means eight wins, if it means nine. Uh, they're going to have some questions on offense with a new quarterback, but we're going to find out soon. I'm hoping USC does well because that's a team who I grew up watching. Washington, obviously they're going to be a completely different program entering the Big Ten in every way you can imagine. Nothing about last season is going to carry over except maybe the expectations after what Kalen DeBoer put together. Jed Fish's work at Arizona compares a lot to what he's got to deal with this year. He's got a young new staff, a lot of key positions on a roster with no direction or identity. They'll probably take it on the chin this season because of their schedule, but Jed knows how to build a long-term recruiting plan, and clearly Washington supports NIL in the portal. They're not going to make the playoff this year or next year, but he's really sm uh, a really smart pick for a rebuild. Yeah, Jed Fish was extremely successful at Arizona, and it was awesome that in only three seasons, he got them to 10 wins after, I don't even think they won two games uh, when he had first got there. So this is a guy who knows what it takes to rebuild a program. Washington has more resources than Arizona did. He brings over five starters from Arizona who are going to obviously start at Washington this year, and they got Will Rogers from Mississippi State, who is one of the most coveted quarterbacks in the portal. Their schedule is really tough. They got to play Michigan and SC. They've got to play at Iowa, at Oregon, at Penn State. I think they're a six win team talent wise, but because they're rebuilding with an entirely new system and an entirely new two deep, they're going to have some struggles transitioning. And I don't know, they're going to win five or six, but uh, what's it going to be? And last, we've got Wisconsin. The focus here is on offense. It was a hard sell for a program like this to embrace a system like Phil, uh, Phil Longo, and it ended up being a mismatch because of personnel. The system he's referring to is the air raid. Are they going to make any big changes? I think there's extra pressure here in year two because they didn't score points last season and they got away from an identity that worked so well in this league. Defensively, we expect them to be much improved. I'd say they're on a timeline similar to what Luke Fickle did at Cincinnati. That's not the side of the ball to worry about here. They need to put up points to get everybody on board with their new identity. It's that simple. You know, last year, they didn't have the personnel to run the offense they wanted to run. They still worked Braylon Allen a lot. I think he was averaging like 15 or 20 carries a game. 
but it didn't feel like he was as impactful as he had been in years past because the offense was much different with Tanner Mordecai at quarterback. I think they only scored like 21 or 22 points a game, and that's what the point of this article is. They need to score points to prove that they're going to be a high-powered offensive team, and honestly, I think Wisconsin's ahead of the curve. They understood, or Luke Fickle understood, where the future of the Big Ten was going, and they couldn't be that downhill run team who just tried to manage the clock and manage the game and hope they stumbled into some wins with really good defensive performances. So it's a huge risk to say we're not going to recruit the biggest, baddest O-linemen and the best running back and not worry about the receivers or the quarterback. But they're, they're going all in on it. And Phil Longo uh, in his first year didn't give us much confidence. I think they had like a middle of the pack offense, like somewhere in the 75 range nationally. So we'll have to see how quickly they can rebuild it. But the question will be, can the defense take a step forward? Can they retain their players and not lose them to the transfer portal? And will Wisconsin come out successful on the other side? But I thought this article was really good. It gave me a lot of insight into what other coaches around the country or around the Big Ten are thinking about these teams. And it's pretty aligned with what I think. I wish they would have been a little bit more savage and more critical of their opponents. You know, they made their comments about Iowa, which I thought were pretty funny. And they did confirm my beliefs about Nebraska. So I think there are positive takeaways from that article. But let me know what you guys think, because we're getting to what? June. We're June right now. So we're a month and a half away from uh, summer ball really starting up. And that's when we're going to see a lot more articles. I'll be able to make more videos and it's going to get exciting real quick. It's coming up pretty soon here. So let me know if you think the the depiction of Nebraska was accurate from those coaches. Do you think that Washington or Oregon can come out and stun some teams early? Or is it going to be USC who pulls off some pretty strong upsets? They play LSU and they play Michigan in the first three weeks of the season. So they'll be an exciting team to track. But that's all I've got for today. So until next time, thank you for being here. And I will see you in the next one. Go Big Red.